Really? Huh. It's just the K chem one. And it, and it won't work. Huh. I'll have to figure that out because that's supposed to be like, if I open it up, then anybody can sort of to join it. Yeah, because I, I have the Zoom app and it goes join the meeting and, and it has your name right here, Zoom meeting. Uh -huh. Every time I try to go in, it says uh, that the ID is not valid. Really? That's weird because I'm using it right now. Maybe I'm going to have to generate a separate one for everyone. I was trying to hoping to avoid that because then I can just tell, put one link in all the classes. And I just basically told my other classes, if it's not your class, then don't go in there and start asking questions. But I guess they can't go in there. So it's all right. <clears throat> We're going to go over this uh, last of the big mechanisms, I guess, is hydrolysis of nitriles. Um, it kind of follows the same theme, uh, but... I'm just going to tell you when you do this, always remember what you're trying to do is reduce the number of bonds between carbon and nitrogen. That's the whole point of the hydrolysis of nitriles is to get rid of this uh, nitrogen. So you have a, a water, uh, you have acid as a catalyst because it's not a very uh, fast reaction. And then the water will attack the carbon and dump the electrons back onto the nitrogen. And then you end up now with a double bond. And just like you had before with the tetrahedral intermediates, you have to deprotonate this before you move on. Because if you don't deprotonate it, this guy, this guy will get ejected going back this way. Oops. It'll get ejected and it'll go back that way. So, so you need to deprotonate. You're right, remove H plus. And that's true for like all the mechanisms we looked at. If you want to go in the forward direction, then this was the thing that Adam was asking about. How do you know which way to go? You just have to know you're going to the end. You have to know the direction you're traveling. So you remove the H plus, you're down to here, right? And then this can, by resonance, push the electron pair back onto the nitrogen. Now we're at a protonated mine. This actually turns out to be uh, relatively acidic, but you deprotonate this, right? And then you're going to protonate this again. So this is a mine hydrolysis. There's a whole other mechanism that goes here. <clears throat> you're going to deprotonate. Let me do it like this. I'll just sketch it out for you. I'm going to flip over the carbonyl just because I hate it being upside down. So I have a, a base, comes in, removes that. Right, and what's your goal? Your goal is to remove this nitrogen. So you need to uh, protonate this. I won't draw all the arrows, but I think you can imagine what they are. And then water is a solvent in this case. It can go like that. And then you have your tetrahedral intermediate. Sorry, I forgot to put that arrow there. Right? And so you can see you're down here, and this thing's protonated. And again, you have to deprotonate this, otherwise it goes backwards. Right? You deprotonate this, and your last step, what you need to get to, actually, before the last step, is you need to get to this. And so there's several steps in here. But I'm going to skip all the several steps. You need to get to that. Again, this is under acidic condition, so you need this guy to, you can protonate this guy. Once you get this thing protonated, you can eject it out. And again, what drives this reaction is a large excess, you have a large excess of water. Right? And that'll help to push this thing out. Any questions? 
by eight. Oh yeah, once you get this thing pushed out, this will have a double bond here, right? And then you deprotonate it and then you're the carboxylic acid. Yes. So it's like one more step. But I'm not gonna draw all the steps because this is all drawn on a previous slide, the amide hydrolysis. But I wanted to sketch it out. Right. Any questions on like where we're going? So go from the NH2 to NH3, we just add uh, uh, there's H plus. It's under acidic conditions. Yeah, but that, but when we're writing our mechanism, we just put H plus. Oh, oh, sorry. Do you just write plus H plus? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. So uh, yeah, that's what everybody does. But I'll want to. If I ask you to draw it, I want to see all the steps. Yeah. So, okay. So. So you can't just say this. You just can't say plus H plus. You can't just say that. You actually have to show like a pair of electrons grabbing the hydrogen. Oh, of course. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, so, so we can't just use H, like showing that as the radius to use the reagent. You can just show this as the reagent because it doesn't tell you what this is. Okay, so yeah, it's probably yeah. hydronium, right? Because yeah, okay. as soon as you put strong acid in water, it dissociates with hydronium. So when we're talking about all of these reactions when we do like this. And, and you have water or alcohol, it's always the protonated version of that that you're dealing with as the proton donor. And the proton acceptor is this. Or if it's an alcohol, it would be the alcohol. Okay. So, um, physical properties. Uh, you can really read most of this part. Uh, but the, the, basically, it goes like this. Uh, all of these are about the same. And we haven't talked about aldehydes or ketones, but the big deal in all of these is they have a carbonyl functional group and no hydrogen. Right? So they're polar. Their boiling points are going to be related to their um, molecular weight. And so if you have an ester that has a higher molecular weight than an aldehyde, it will have the higher boiling point. But the intermolecular forces are basically all the same. The ones that are different are the amide and the carboxylic acid. These are actually a lot higher because they have hydrogen bonding, right, for one. So for an amide, you have like this. Oops, I put an N in this for carbon. So you have the lone pair and you have the hydrogens that can hydrogen bond. Carboxylic acid is the same. You have the oxygen and the hydrogen like that. Um, but it turns out these are disproportionately large. So like if you're looking at boiling point trends and you're thinking like a carboxylic acid will just be a little bit higher than an ester because their molecular weights are the same, you'd kind of be really wrong because if you look at the trend, these are some actual numbers, right? Alcohol, hydrogen bonding, right? So it's fairly high. Esters, acyl chlorides, ketones, aldehydes, ethers. The ethers low because um, it's less polar because it doesn't have the carbonyl. These are all relatively high, but look how much higher these are. They're like double. And it's cool because what's actually happening is in solution, oh, it's cool to me, uh, is that these guys form dimers with each other. They hydrogen bond to themselves. And so what ends up happening is they do this. And this is the same kind of interaction. And one of the reasons why this is cool, it's the same kind of interaction uh, that you see in um, DNA. Yeah. yeah, you get you get sort of reciprocal hydrogen bonding that makes it a really strong interaction. And that's why you know, your DNA just doesn't fall apart all the time. That you have lots of interactions. And so it turns out because they can do this intramolecular hydrogen bonding to each other like this, they form these dimers, and so effectively the molecular weight doubles, right? And then nitrogen, um, the resonance form of nitrogen, nitrogen is a good electron donor. So when you're thinking about resonance structures, it spends a lot of its time like this. Because nitrogen is a better electron donor than oxygen. We actually see this in DNA as well. In DNA, in the in the double helix, the the or I 
right now is the double helix active, but for proteins, the alpha helix. And the protein alpha helix, there's a, there, the turn radius of the alpha helix, that is the, the rate at which the amino acid spiral is determined by this bond, All right? So in an amino acid, you're gonna have something that looks like this, carbon, like uh, oxygen, you'll have a nitrogen. Uh, and I'll just, actually, let me draw it like you would normally see it. Uh, I'm gonna draw an amino acid first, and then I'll, I'll make the peptide bond. And then uh, let's see, C, CH, and we'll have an R here, and then we'll have a, so this is kind of how you see amino acids. I guess, you see, actually, you know what? I'll draw it like, I think the biologists draw it. They put the nitrogen at this end, and then they have a CH, and then they have an R group. That's what makes them all different, right? Yeah, is the CH2, and then you have COOH. So we see it like that. But what happens is these, these will form amide bonds, and that's what we call the peptide bond. That's the bond that connects each of the amino acids together. So you end up with this. So I'll draw, I'm gonna draw two of them bonded together. I'm gonna call this R2. It could be it could be the same as the other R, but I'm gonna call R2. I'll call that R1 just for consistency. And then you'll have like this. And we'll learn about this uh, in later chapters. But this is known as a dipeptide. It's got uh, or it's a peptide bond, so because it's got two amino acids, and this bond is the peptide bond. And you can see it's just an amide. And because it's an amide, it has a resonance structure that does this. And it ends up looking a lot like that. And because there's a lot of double bond character to this bond here, you have to think about the way proteins coil, they'll coil like this. That double bond, because the bond angle is 120 degrees, it's 109, limits the rate of rotation of that bond. So the, the turn radius, basically, of the amino acids dependent on that bond. So there's a lot of nitrogen, like the ability of nitrogen to donate to the carbonyl functional group has a lot of like areas that, it, that you see it in. Uh, but one of them is also it's, it, it's, it's intermolecular forces between itself and another uh, amide. And so because the nitrogen's donating electron density to the carbon, there's a lot of negative charge on the oxygen, which then you have these ionic like interactions that occur between the nitrogen of one and the oxygen of the other, right, and vice versa. So that increases its intermolecular forces a lot. And so when you're looking at amides, right, carboxylic acids are like double most of these, except for this guy. Then amide is double that. It's like normally in trends, it's just like, oh, a few degrees here and there, right? These trends are big. So I expect you guys to do that. Um, ah, I'm gonna skip this. I actually cover this, um, in the chapter on, on lipids. So let's skip it. Then we can skip this. We can skip that. Skip that. Skip that. Yeah, primary amino synthesis. We'd already talked about this a little bit. So the the one of the catalysts they use for this is called rainy nickel. And rainy nickel is just uh, It's a nickel catalyst, uh, but in the nickel catalyst, what they do is they uh, have aluminum in it and they dissolve it with hydrochloric acid. And what the hydrochloric acid does is it preloads the hydrogen. This, this is in the rainy nickel. We don't even know what the rainy nickel is made of. It's aluminum and nickel. Well, okay, so. When you get it, it's aluminum and nickel, and then you dissolve it in hydrochloric acid. And the hydrochloric acid reacts with the aluminum and produces hydrogen, which stays inside the catalyst. Is it the Randy? What's it? What's it in the Randy? Rainy? Rainy? Randy? Randy? 
Randy Nickel would be a whole different thing, I'm going to say. Yeah, Randy Nickel, right? So, so the hydrogen is actually charged into the, the, the nickel catalyst, and then they use that. So you can add a mole of hydrogen that way, or however you want to call it. Um, we didn't do the, some years I do it, some years I don't. We do the catalyst hydrogenation using a palladium catalyst. And that kind of experiment, typically you just, you're supposed to bubble hydrogen through the system. So basically you make a hydrogen generator, you constantly have to bubble hydrogen through it. You don't have to do that with this because it's coming from the solution. It's actually made in the solution and already there. We may do the hydrogenation as part of the lipids. So. Okay. There are also dicarboxylic acids. The old, I don't care that you know all these names, but if you're gonna um, if, if you're gonna take uh, any biochem in the future, you're probably gonna have to know all those names. Just gonna tell you that. Um, but the only thing I wanted to point out about di di dicarboxylic acids is for the smaller ones, the PKAs, right? They're very different from each other. And as you get to the larger ones, the PKAs are the same. For the smaller ones, you'll notice this PKA is really low, right? And for the, as, as you get to the larger one, typically this PKA rises. The reason for this one being so low is because, <clears throat> like see how these are similar in, in magnitude? Uh, the reason for that being so low is because there's a lot of steric interaction between these two hydrogens in the solution. And so it wants to get rid of one of them. So it pops it off. So like in here, you can really see it in here because you can see that both those hydrogens are at the same location. So if it pops one of them off, actually what happens is this oxygen will hydrogen bond to this hydrogen and stabilize it. So typically what happens in a lot of these is this one's high and this one's low. All right. But really that's all I want you to know. They're, they're, if you're dealing with small ones, your PKAs are gonna be much lower. Dealing with large ones like this, at least chains like this, then they'll be fairly close to what you expect. Um, a lot of times you can use these as acid catalysts where you can't use these as acid catalysts just because their PKAs are low. Um, yeah, there's some other notes that I'll let you read all that. But right, electrostatic repulsion between light charges. Yes, yeah, cyclic anhydrides can be formed. Um, often they'll use a catalyst in these. The catalyst all it needs to do, if you think about how this mechanism would have to work, um, is that it, it has to allow for that. Oh, we're missing some of the slide. Yeah. You're missing the slide? Ah, yeah, oh, jeez. Yeah, I have it. Well, I think the actual. It's on the slide set. Slide, slide packet? No. Cole says he has it. Oh, yeah, it's because mine. Oh, didn't po copy both sides? Do you have a blank? No, it just it, it cuts off because our next one is the uh, activating the uh, uh, acid. acid. So we have this one. That one? Yeah, so it's going to take a whole, uh, it's gonna take oh. a whole slide. Oh, all right. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, you can download them. So here's, I just want to make this point. Draw this, OK? All you need to catalyze this reaction is something that'll produce a positive charge over here. So like a metal ion can do it because it can complex to that oxygen and form a positive, be a positive charge up there to make that more electrophilic, right? You can use uh, even acetic anhydride because the acetic anhydride is also electrophilic. This is acetic anhydride. It can also make a bond with that, okay? So there's a lot of things that can catalyze reactions like this. And you'll see this as you read, you know, it's not always acid that has to be the catalyst. Sometimes they'll use metal ions like zinc. That's a common one for people to zinc, use zinc or iron. The whole point is, is to make this carbon, make this carbon more electrophilic. So let me just make a note, needs to be more electrophilic. And then what will happen is, if that's the case, 
once you can make that positive charge on the oxygen, then it's easier for this oxygen to attack, right? And form this, the anhydride. The other way to do it is just heat the crap out of it. Because <laughs> when you heat it, right, you can drive the water off and use the shot liaise principle to pull it to one side. So heat will make it go faster, right? And then you, you evaporate the water out of the product and it'll cyclize and form a product. Uh, let's see, what else is there? That's really all there is. You could use a catalyst. Like I said, you can use catalyst. You can use heat. There's a bunch of ways you can do this. Can you tell like the mechanism of this? Or no? no, not really. It, it's, 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 it's the same mechanism as any, uh, like we showed anhydride reaction before. Yeah. Uh, it's the same mechanism. Make a positive charge on the oxygen and attack with the other. It's the same mechanism. Yeah, this is what I was just mentioning. Uh, to make these, you can use acetic anhydride because this is an electrophilic carbon. So one of this oxygen can attack that puts a positive charge on the oxygen here, right? Just like this. And then what will happen is once you have this, that's a bad placement alone, pair, sorry. It goes to this oxygen. Um, it'll form positive charge and it'll speed up the reaction. Uh, let's see what else is there generally. Uh, these I mentioned before already. I mentioned thionyl chloride for activating, um, or did I do the activation? I talked about dehydration in nitros. Did I talk about activation? This is the same mechanism that's in. Yeah, so, so for, that was for dehydrations of uh, amides to nitros. But you can also use uh, thionyl chloride to replace the oxygen with a halogen. And this is the same reaction we looked at last semester when we talked about um, activating alcohol functional groups. So that it's actually the exact same mechanism. In the, in the reaction for the thionyl, oops, sorry. So again, you can pull this off uh, uh, earlier material. Um, sorry, so an S and then a Cl and a Cl, Cl here. Um, you can do this, right? And then you end up with put the S in there first. And actually, the way I learned it is to do it like that. I don't know that it matters that much. You should, after learning it like this, uh, I, I realized it'd be a lot easier just to just attack with the chlorine to the sulfur. You know what I'm saying? From from here, from sorry, from the oxygen to the sulfur. Yeah, instead of doing all this, these electron arrow pushing, I learned it this way because I learned it with a carboxylic acid with a hydrogen out here. Okay. So that's typically how it's done with a carboxylic acid. So I probably should have just done this because it comes out to be exactly the same thing. I did it like through resonance and moving of the electron arrows. Okay, so anyways, you end up with um, like this. Like that, all right? And then chloride. That's present in the solution because you just kicked one off, right? You can come in like this, and then this collapses like this. This is the mechanism that we did in uh, first semester. Oops, sorry about that. So that that gives you your product. It actually I will give you the acyl halide. And it'll also give you uh, the SO2 and then the extra CO. But this is the same as alcohol activation. PCL3, 
works the same way. You can see the similarity. You picked up the oxygen on the phosphorus and pushed off a pushed off a chlorine, right? So you can imagine this attacks displaces a chlorine, and then SN two like reaction coming in on the backside, popping this guy up. Right? That's what's happening here, right? Attacking the, the oxygen attacks the sulfur, kicks off a chlorine. Chlorine comes back and kicks that back. Is the exact same mechanism. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I, this is the mechanism listed out here for that last part that I just listed out for you. But both of these, both of these activating agents, what they do is they produce good leading groups, which are kicked off by chloride. Uh, yeah, and then once you have this, right, you can make all the other stuff. This is actually just a summary of all the reactions before. All right, um, let's see. I, you need to know this reaction, don't need to know the mechanism. Another way to uh, activate uh, carboxylic acids is make anhydrides out of them. Right? Let's see if I, I just want to see really quickly what I have on the rest of the slides. Yeah, a bunch of mechanisms that are similar. Yeah, I think that's, go ahead and, and look at those. You can go through the last slide on your own, but they're basically uh, more examples of activation reactions, and we already showed these two. Um, this one's the same thing, PBR3. PBR3 also can replace, do you not have that slide? You, ha you have it because you have it in your yeah, tablet, right? I have it. Is that yeah. one? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is basically a summary of the activation reactions that we covered. And these are the same reactions that we did with alcohols. All you're doing is replacing this oxygen. Uh, this is actually the mechanism drawn out. Yeah, so that's what I did on, sort of did on the slide. So we're good. Uh, so what I want to do with the rest of the time, which is a lot, is talk about the NMR, yeah. Well, yeah, I wanted to go over it with you guys. Well, maybe I should keep recording. So do you guys have, because this is the first one I want to spend, cause, and it's lecture material, lab material at the same time. I want to spend some time in lecture talking about it. So pull them out and I'll, I'll uh, I will find them on my hard drive here somewhere. Oh, that's weird. It's not showing up. It usually shows up in the recent files list. I think it's in the 29A one, actually. No, it's not that one. Oh, let's see. Maybe it is in the second semester folder. I don't know. A lot of times I do this in first semester just because we have an NMR that works. All right. Would we have used an NMR first semester? Yeah, if it was working, we'd have started using it around week three or four. The hydrocarbon NMR thing would have been right then. And then all semester, you just collect and verify. Oh, this is the peak. I should have a peak here. I have a peak here. I have a peak here. I have a peak. Right. Yeah, but now we're having to shove it all into this semester. But in a yeah, in a way, it's kind of nice and uh, yeah, not having to head dealt with it. I'm not. Well, I'll just see if I can find it here. Yeah. 
All right, this is sideways, unfortunately. I don't know if I can make it for you. How do you rotate it? This is a little simple. Suppose I go on this? Yeah, this. Uh, I'm not. I'm using Acrobat, not. Yeah, I use it to to my text. Oh. Uh, let's do view. It's probably something under view. Rotate view. Yeah, here we go. Clockwise. Nice. But, uh, Which one do you want to start with? Yeah, we're going to go through them all. 14, what's the first one? Yeah. 15. Dude, 14, 15. How are you going to say that's the first one? Oh, yeah, because it's my starter page. Yeah, it's like 14, 15. I don't know what you guys are talking about. What? <laughs> yeah, 14, 15, you know, what first one, last one. Oh, How about this one? Compound 24? Yeah. This, I don't even know. I guess it's confusing. I'm not helping at all, but you know, I'm just saying. That's a little confusing. Okay, so, so what'd you get for the empirical formula? 21. Uh, C5H10. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so C5H10. That's it? Oh, two. Uh, one degree of. Uh... Yeah, saturation. Yeah, one degree of saturation because you ignore the oxygens. I can't write on the screen. I don't think unless I do the editing thing. I'll try it in a second. So then, so then, um, good. That's what you have. Do you see anything in the functional groups? There's no OH, so we can only uh, no OH. Okay. And one degree on saturation, right? Yeah. Okay. So a one degree of unsaturation indicates double bond. Yeah, right. So then you look at at this. And you see this, it's kind of hard to see, unfortunately, uh, unless you can do that. There really isn't a good alkene peak. It is a little bit to the left of 3,000. It's not that far left. That sort of still looks like hydrocarbons. So. Usually, if you have an alkene, you get a CH shifted to the left, and it's a peak, usually. Um, you also, what's that? Yeah, that's a carbonyl, right? So that, that looks like our degree of unsaturation. So we're looking at this. And then we have one more oxygen. So you have choices, right? It could be ether, whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, all the things with oxygen. So. The other thing that we have is we can look at this. And this actually tells you like what it is. Okay. See this? Three, right? What's three usually? Methyl, right? But where's methyl usually? It's usually way over here, right? Yeah. So that tells us that this must be close to the oxygen. In fact, it must be on the oxygen yeah. in order for it to be that far. It's a singlet, so how many neighbors does it have? Can't have any, right? So now what we have is we have this. We have this part of the structure. And remember, this is 2.5, and this adds a little bit to it, so maybe it's shifted by 3, so that's why it's pretty close to 4. Instead of being a 1, it's still 4. You added 3 or so to it, a little bit more than 2.5, because, because it's next to all those electronegative groups. Then you have to figure out what this is, right? And you'll, you see this one's shifted too, right? So this one's next to an oxygen as well, but not like directly on the oxygen. Does that make sense? So that's going to have to be a carbon that's like over here. Most likely, it's a carbon that's over here. And how many hydrogens does it have on it? One. One. So what does that mean? It has on it. Two other carbons. It has, it has to have two other carbons on it. Right? And the two, the six, right? Two methyl groups. Two methyl groups. Yeah. So you're looking at CH3, CH3. So that would be your structure. Now let's see if I can get this thing so I can write on it. Comment, pen. I can highlight. There it is. There's the pen. Okay. 
So, so right now we're looking at something like this, C H uh, three. Uh, I think I'm writing too big. Can I erase? Actually, can I erase oh, with this? Ah, okay, we're ready to. Let's do this. This, all right, C double bondo. That's what that tells us. The, the only thing that you get out of this is that. Yeah, the molecular weight. Um, I talked to Mr. Thiessen about this too, and he and I are of the same uh, sort of mindset on mass spec, even though there's a ton of information in there, most of the time we just use it for molecular weight, All right? And, and with the molecular weight, as long as you know that the elemental composition has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it, you can get the empirical formula without even doing per the percents to moles and dividing by. You can't, don't have to do that whole empirical formula process. Anyways, it doesn't hurt to do it, but that's just to verify. Like if you do it one time and it doesn't work out, then go back to your empirical formula and see if it still fits. Go to your percents, assume that it's a hundred gram sample and, and percents are grams, convert to moles and divide by the smallest. And I went through that really fast because that was like chem 3A. So that was like a way long time ago. Can you show us how to do that again? Can you show us again? Yeah. Can you convert that into yeah, you can. You just do this. You go, you go like this. You go carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's why I'm doing this, by the way, because I say that like, ah, you can figure it out. But I know some of you are like, yeah, I could. I don't remember that. I don't... Yeah, yeah, you haven't, you haven't done it since one A. <laughs> so I say it kind of flippantly, actually. So I apologize, but. 58.80 grams is what you assume, right? That's not a comma. Ah, oh, gosh darn it, where's my eraser? It's gonna make me crazy. Well, that looks like an eraser. Ah, nice. I don't know why the pen's so fat. I could probably adjust that if I figure out how to do it, but I don't know how to do it. And then it's, uh, that's grams. Ah, oh, Jesus, sorry. I want the tool, but it won't, there. This is grams. It's not the best writing tool, and 12.01 uh, grams for every one mole. You do the same thing for the hydrogen. You'll say 9.87 grams times then 1.01 grams for every one mole. And then for the oxygen, it's a horrible pencil, sorry. Okay. 31.3. Sorry, that hopefully you can read that, but it's not tracking well. The app doesn't, it's trying to make like smooth curves out of everything, and so everything looks pretty forward. Worse than usual. How's that? 12 point ah, 16 point zero zero grams in one mole. And then you divide by the smallest. That'll give you the empirical formula. And then what you do is you figure out how much the empirical formula weighs, look at the molar mass, and you figure out how big the molecule is, okay? So on this one, I'm just gonna write over everything and I'll just get the numbers for you real quick. Um, I'll do it on my phone, I guess. So it's gonna be 58.8 divided by 12.01. Uh, and that comes to 4.896. I'm just going to, I'm going to leave it. No, I'm not going to call it five. 4.896. Um, and the reason I, and that's moles. The reason I did that is you basically have four sig figs in a number. I'm just keeping track of sig figs. I don't even think about it anymore. So 9.87 divided by 1.01. 9.77 moles. And the oxygen is usually, you should expect this. Oxygen is usually, if, it, if it's there, or the nitrogen, the atom that's not carbon and hydrogen is usually the lowest one. Just because it's organic chemistry and it's mostly carbon and hydrogen. So 31.35 divided by 16. 
and that's uh, 1.96. Like that. And it's the smallest one, so I'm going to take 4.89 and divide it by 1.96. 2.5. Yay. And then I'm going to take 9.77 and divide it by 1.96. Uh, God dang it. Four. No, no, like just five. Nine point. Shh, stop arguing about what you had before. Divided by 1.96. Five. This is one. So, like, technically now you should round it. You should not round it up, but multiply it by two, right? So you get C4, C5, sorry. H10. Oh, two. Is that what you got? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's how you do it. But you did the rule of 13, I'm guessing. No. No? Use the rule of 13. It should still work out. We, uh, most of you put um, carbon or those um, AEs as percents. <laughs> so, so, so it's gonna be the percents you use as grams. Because you say you have a 100 gram sample. So there's 100 grams of sample. That means there's going to be 58.8 grams of carbon. Yeah, so use 0 0.5880 each time to buy the molar mass of the whole thing. Because it gives you like 60. Yeah, and divide it by divided by the mass. What? Yeah. By both. Oh, did you not use did you use the fraction? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's all proportional. It's easier and faster. Okay. So rule of 13 would say I have 102, right? So 102 divided by 13, that gives me 7.84 something. 7.846. So this is uh, 102 divided by 13. So you know it's C7. Uh, they keep going to the eraser and it's still a pencil. C seven H and this is going to be seven plus whatever 0.849 represents in terms of hydrogens. And so you're going to go like this uh, zero. You're going to take this number and you just multiply it by 13. So point. So I'll subtract seven from that and I'll multiply that by 13. And that gives me the remainder, basically. It's 11. Like that. Okay, so uh, if that's 11, then this number is 7 plus 11. So that's 18. So now I have uh, C7H18. Like that. And, and then what you do is you subtract a carbon and four hydrogens for every oxygen. Because that's the equivalent mo molecular weight. So this actually gives you, and, and this is the problem with uh, the rule of 13 method, is you, you have to have a little, you have a little guessing involved, right? So it's C6H14. Uh, <sighs> Dang it. That's, Fourteen, O, and then you also have C five, uh, H ten, and O two. <laughs> yeah, that's two. Okay, so you know that is this, right? Yeah. Right. But how did how would you know that? You have to look at the IR, and you'll be looking for like CO bonds. Because that would tell you they had a carbon. Because you can already see you have a CO double bond. Then you would look at like 1,200-ish looking for this pick. This is a CO single bond. That tells you you probably have an ester. So then you think, oh, I probably have two oxygens. So rather than doing the whole empirical formula thing, you can look at your functional groups from your IR spectra and figure out like, oh, I've got to have this many.
Huh? Oh, no, that's seal bond, single bond. So this, this guy here is a C O bond. Yeah, and this is a, what could be an alcohol, but you don't see the alcohol, right? Yeah, that's yeah so this means you could have a CO, it could be alcohol, it could be an ether. Right? Yeah, but if it was an alcohol, it would have up a... But this is C double bond O, right? Yeah. And so you kind of know based on just looking at this peak and that peak, well, I probably have an ester, I have some sort of carbonyl, I have a, you know, I could have an ether. You, there's a thing, a list of things you can have, but both of them have two oxygens. <laughs> what right. does uh, aldehyde have? Aldehyde? Um, Aldehyde will actually have a fairly unique peak right here around 27, 2800. It's pretty big. That's for the CH, right? And then it'll also have uh, the C double bond O, and I think that's like at 1600 or something, 1650. Go ahead. I did the rule of 13s by subtracting 32 from 102. I dignified that by 13. Because you knew, but you were assuming that you had two oxygens. Well, if you knew you had two oxygens, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, I still got the same group. Yeah, yeah. If, if you look, if, but it all boils down to when you're doing the rule of 13, you have to look at the IR spectrum. And then you get an idea of like what other functional groups you have in there. This, in this problem, and the way these, <laughs> sorry, I'm just going to scribble all of it. The way this information is given is you're given that it's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So once you know there's an oxygen, you start looking for the oxygen functional groups in your IR spectrum. Once you see them, you can assume like you get two, subtract 32 from the total, and then divide by 13, and that'll tell you C's. Uh, the way you did it, how do you know you had two oxygens then? Oh, I didn't until I, I what, so I did it kind of like the way I would have done it. Hey. What's that? Can I get this document real quick? Yeah. Sorry to bother. You don't even have to get it real quick. We're in, we're in spectroscopy, go over problem times. Nice. Okay. Do you ever do the rule of 13? Have you ever done that? Yeah. yeah. I like it. Yeah, it's so great. easy. Yeah, but then you have to know spectroscopy. Right. <laughs> That's what I'm telling them right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so like here, right? I just did it like this because I said, well, I'm gonna assume I've got an oxygen, because it's got I mean, like it tells you you have an oxygen. Ugh. It tells you you have an oxygen in the problem. But then what I did was I said, well, I could have two, and so I just did, I was doing the progression. So I have one oxygen and two oxygen. That's a two, two oxygens. And then I, then what I did is, I looked at the spectrum and I said, "Well, I have a carbonyl, and then I have that, so I know that's probably what it is." So sixteen, seventeen hundred ish carbonyl. Twelve hundred is almost always CO. Big, big. They're big too, so they're easy to see. Right. The more polar the bond is, the bigger the IR stretch will be. The bigger the signal will be. Um, the other thing, too, then, after that, I did it. I looked at NMR. Sorry about all the scribbling on the screen. Okay. So when it only tracks one finger, it's just like, shh, shh. Yeah. For the test for NMR problems, we're going to have, uh, are there going to be IR spectrums? We're going to have a list of... Yeah, so it'll be a sheet just like one of these. And then what I'll give you is I'll give you the correlation table. Oh, okay. Yeah, it'll just say, you know, these... And then at, towards the end, I'll stop giving it to you because I'll assume you know what a C double bond O is and a CO is. Because at some point, you kind of should know. Yeah? <laughs> it's like PKAs, right? You should know them all by now. Ask Cole if you don't, but not on a test, because Cole will probably remember them all. I got a general understanding of uh, the ones we went over last semester. Yeah. Like water through carboxylic. Yeah, and basically, that's kind of all you're going to see. I don't know. Yeah, and, and if there's anything weird, you, know, you can always ask me. I'll say, oh, yeah, we didn't cover that. I'll give it to you. And I mean, 35. They're high, yeah. Well, you know, it's, you just got to know it's really high because, you know. Oh, God, dang it. I'm just trying to just scroll to the next one. Uh, yeah. Oh, C's and H's. That one's a piece of pie. Woo! That's only what I know. That water. That water. <laughs> Carboxylic acid? Ah, see? You, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. 
HCL is like minus two. Oh. Minus three. Right. What about HBR? One point something. No, it's minus seven. <laughs> minus eight. So HI is like minus nine. And they just get stronger and stronger and stronger. Okay, so sorry. Um, yeah, so what did you get for the empirical formula? Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. I did all these last week, I guess, but nine, eight, H, 12. Do you have Hey Siri activated? Is that what that is? Yeah. Hey Siri, call me Big Boss. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, not reactive. <laughs> Dang it. I used to do that on people's phones all the time. No, they'd leave them unlocked, so I'd just tell them to call them different things. And the next time they did Hey Siri, they would say, Hey, big man, or hey, you know. Yeah, my cousin put it as a big, sexy or something. Yeah, yeah. That's embarrassing. Okay, so a um, couple of things about this is you have a formula. You could have followed the, uh, and the molecular weights here, right? And you have this empirical formula information. You could do rule 13 because it's straight hydrocarbon is easy because you don't have to think about subtracting. So you get the formula right away. Right, Cole? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> IR spectrum, generally not interesting except two features. OH? No, there's no H. Uh, this is actually a CC double bond, I believe. And this is a benzene ring. But the other really cool thing that at least I think it's a really cool thing. It's these guys down here, which apparently I can't highlight. That's not highlighting. Oh, well. Highlighter. I'll I'll try to circle it. Those guys right there. What's that? yeah. So this is a, this is a weird signal pattern, right? Yeah. These are what are called the overtones of benzene, and they all line up in the same place like that. And when you see four peaks, this is there's a lot of, there's a lot that could be said about these peaks, but I will s just say this. If you see four, it's a singly substituted benzene ring. What happens if there's five? Huh? There's five peaks. How about five? Well, okay, so when you see this pattern of four or five, yeah. uh, actually it's supposed to be four, I believe. I don't know what the other peak is. But if you see the, that little like comb, right. that tells you have a benzene ring with one substituent on it. There's a bunch of patterns, but here's the problem. When you have other functional groups like oxygens or nitrogens, you can't usually see it. It's usually obscure because it's so small. Okay. So you can only see it really on singly or doubly substituted benzene rings. And after that, it just gets really hard to see. So, so I'm already assuming when I look at this that I have a benzene ring. So I know I'm working with this. Right? And then the question is, what's everything else? Because if I know that I have this, I've taken care of six carbons and five <laughs> hydrogens. So now I have C. Um, Bless you, you are? Yeah. You have a hernia or a stroke. C3H, and that was a 12, right? So <laughs> I'm going to subtract five from it, seven. So I have to have, that looks weird, seven hydrogens and three carbons, not in the ring, right? Yeah. And they all have to be one substituent because there's only, because of this, there's only one substituent. Right? Now, if you didn't know that, you could have still figured it out because you wouldn't have been able to place the NMR spectrum properly. It would have come out, you would have had, you couldn't make it match. So what, what's, what's this? That's the benzene ring, right? So you see this, right? Two things about that peak that are important. What is important? It's a doublet and its position, close to one. Anything close to one or to the, especially to the right of one, is almost always a methyl group, okay? So this, the, it's a doublet, it's close to one, and then the other thing is there's six of them. So it's two methyl groups, right? That's what that's telling you. So this is two CH3s. This is one neighbor. And then this is probably methyl. 
And then you see this. How many peaks are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Six and eight Normally you can't, see, you're not gonna see that little. And you know that it's two CH3s, not three CH2s. Ah, because it's closer to one. Ones would be further to the left. That's one aspect of it. And if it was three CH2s, there's no carbons left. Yeah, I don't know how you would do that. All right. So, but that might be something that you speculate and then you draw it out. You go, oh, I can't do that because there's no, because I need to have right, another carbon if that's the case. And I don't have it. All right, because remember, this would be one carbon. If you said that was three, then it'd be a total of four, and you ran out because you only have three. So now we're going to deal with how do you generate this signal? What's that, what's that going to be? How's it going to look? An isopropyl, isopropyl group, like this. And then your benzene ring is like this. So that's for that. I'm oh, sorry. I guess I'll, I will brave the eraser one more time. Cool and everything, but right, that signals for that guy, and there's five of them, right? This is for the one. I'm gonna draw the hydrogen in. That's for this guy, right? and then I have like this. Now. Um, Sorry, child care issue. Okay, so um, are they all grown already? So yeah, it was long story short. Five more minutes, I'm out of here. <laughs> I have to be mom today. Oh. <laughs> huh? It's only really bad when the children are still nursing. But, uh, sorry, I'll leave it at that. Um, this is the way I want you to label these things. A, B, C, like that. And then you can call these the A's. You don't have to label all of them. You could even say like CH3 and then just say that's A like that. And then B, you probably should draw that one out. That would be B. And these would be C, like that. Again, you don't have to do all of them, just indicate like they're all the same or something like that, right? Which one? 26. <laughs> oh, the next one. Yes. Yeah. I was going to do 26. I can do that in four minutes. You know why? Because that's all the time I have. <laughs> What's that? If I get 26 done, then we'll do the next one. I don't even remember if I did this one. What is, oh, it's got nitrogen in it. Okay, so when you do the, okay, well. Yeah, so I typed this in there, right? For the degrees of unsaturation, you're going to use this formula. So two times the carbons, the nitrogens, and plus two. That's the number of hydrogens you should have. And then you'll, okay. So, so what do you get for the empirical formula? C2H3N, and then and then for the degrees of unsaturation, uh, right? So I'm going to put in uh, for the hydrogens that it should have. Uh, it's going to be uh, let's see, two times two, so it's four uh, plus two for a nitrogen plus two. That ends up being eight. Wait, it's two for hydrogen. I thought it was, it was just, it's, it's plus oh yeah, one. Ugh. Yeah, so one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so that ends up being seven. Yeah. That's how many it should have. So now you have three, right? This is the number of hydrogens that are missing. So this will be four. So there's two degrees of unsaturation for that. Okay, so the, that could be all kinds of things. That could be um, 
double bonds, right? Two double bonds, a triple bond, uh, things like that. So what are your options here, right? So you have not many actually. Ha, ah, sorry. Yeah. There's not like a simple undo thing in here. It's really annoying. Well, that's, that's the thing we're going to do here real quick. Okay. Um, this dude. Um, right, so where's 3,000, and there's this guy here, right? Um, let's see. Oh, here's the other thing. Uh, I only have a single P. Yeah. Right? Hmm. So I don't have too many choices. I'm going to do this uh, the brute force way for now. I could have a triple bond to nitrogen. That's a pretty common thing, right? And then what would you have on that? If, what would be left if you did that? A CH3, right? Now, um, the other option is this. Nah, it's too too few atoms really to be cyclic. Yeah. But you can also do this. Uh, let's see if there's anything else that we can come up with. You could also have C triple bond C like that. It would have an H here and an NH2. Like that? And a nitrogen like that? Okay. And then uh, you would have hydrogen and hi yeah. So yeah, you can do that. Okay, but you only have one. Well, you only have one signal. And that means number three is not unsaturated. What's that? That means number three of unsaturated is probably one. No, the ring. No, the ring counts as one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So most likely not this, because you have this and you have that. So those would be different signals, right? Here you have one, and here you have one, right? And then you have to figure out what this is, and that's C, I believe it's that. Right. So it's a nitrile. Yeah? Um, Other than that, man, there is just not much there. Did we ever do like an isopropyl? Can we identify that isopropyl? Yeah, we just did. What do you mean? As by itself? Also, oh, would I get? Would I just give you like? You can't. You, I, I mean, I give you isobutyl. That would be isobutyl. So when you use it, but an isopropyl functional group has to have something it's attached to. So the smallest thing that you call iso would be like a butane. Isobutane. That would be isobutane because it's got the four carbons on it. Isopropyl, then you're just like missing a carbon. You can't be iso. Would I give you propane? Yeah, sure. Why not? It would be weird, though. This guy? No, he's asking if. Oh, would I just give you an ion? Yeah. Uh, possibly. But but if I gave you an ion, it would say like up in here, soluble. Uh, you see how it says there's some other information in here? Yeah, and this is how you verify these answers, by the way. You just look it up and say, oh, yeah, it has the same boiling point. Yeah. This is acetonitrile, yeah. is what it's called. But it's a common organic solvent. And did you, but it would say, like, soluble water if it's ionic, right? And that would be the clue, like, oh, because there'll be, like, a sodium in the formula. and be like, what's this sodium doing in here? This is organic chemistry. And it'll say soluble water, and then you'll know it's some sort of ionic. Well, that's all I have time for. Go away. Well, <laughs> <laughs>